Transplantation is quite simply the replacement of a diseased or a failed organ with a new one. The concept of transplants is as old as the human race itself. Humans have been obsessed with the idea of restoring and replacing mutilated, damaged, or diseased body parts with new ones. The oldest example of transplantation that I can think of is from the Vedic age. Now, that equates roughly to 1500 to 500 BC. Hindu mythology has it that Lord Shiva, the deity of renouncement and death, had been away from home for a long time. So Parvati, his wife, when she found out that he was returning home after a long absence, she wanted to be ready for him and went in for a bath. Then she realized that her regular house guard was away. So what she did was, she blew life into some turmeric paste that she was using for her bath and created her son Ganesha. And then she asked him to guard the house. Now Ganesha and Shiva had never met. So when Shiva returned home, Ganesha wouldn't let him in. And this made Shiva very angry. Shiva beheaded Ganesha in anger. Parvati was livid. She told Shiva he couldn't come into the house until he brought back Ganesha to life. Not only that, she said that Ganesha would have to be one of the most revered gods for all time to come. So Shiva sent his men out looking for a head. They found a baby elephant's head. And Shiva put this baby elephant's head onto Ganesha and brought him back to life. Then there was this brilliant Indian surgeon, Sushrut, who lived in 1500 to 200 BC. And his science of medicine and surgery is described in a scripture called Sushrut Samhita. Back then, adultery and other crimes used to be punished with people's noses getting cut off. And they would promptly go to Sushrut and had him stitch them back on. One such man who had his nose cut off couldn't actually find his nose, as in he physically lost his nose. So Sushrut took some tissue and skin from his buttock and actually made him a new nose. Then in the Christian era, Christ, at the time of his arrest, felt pity on a high priest's servant and put his ear back. His ear had been previously cut off by Peter. And then came um, Saint Surgeons Cosmas and Damien, who in the fifth century replaced a cancerous white leg with a black person's leg. Things were pretty easy then. Divine miracles and magic would make anything imaginable happen. Change organs, fly chariots, or apparitions. But it took scientists centuries of labor-intensive work to make these things happen as human efforts. We call them transplantation, drones and planes, and holograms today. If you consider that the human machine is one of the most complex ever, then what we scientists have been trying to do for hundreds of years is to reverse engineer the human body. We make observations and then try and find out why they happen. Now, to help you all share the excitement of the developments in modern transplantation, I will have to explain two concepts to you. One is the concept of cells and molecules being the building blocks of the body. So there is the body, and then there are organs, in this case, the liver, and then there are cells, a single cell, and then molecule. Molecules are within the cell and on the surface of the cells. Now, if you consider humans as units of cities, states, and countries, then cells are units of tissue, body parts, organs, and the human body. Just like a country runs with its human beings interacting with each other, the human body functions with cells interacting with each other. So the cells actually talk to each other 
with two surface features. One of the surface features is um, antigen. There are molecules called antigens. Antigens are actually, uh, they make up the genetic ID of a person. They are specific to a person. In fact, they're like alphabet of your genetic name. The other surface feature that cells use to interact with each other are molecules called receptors. So cells have these receptors and antigens, and they talk to each other with chemical signals. Now, this is akin to the situation where human beings interact with each other based on external features and with their five senses and language. The other concept that I wanted to explain to you is self versus non-self. Now, all the cells that have the right ID are welcome, and all others are not. So what happens to the non-self cells? Well, the immune system of the body, in the shape of special cells called T cells, actually attack these non-self cells. These non-self cells are attacked by T cells by their special signals, which act like arrows and bullets that kill the intruding cell. The T cells are, in fact, the foot soldiers of the body. And the T part of the T cell is actually the thymus. T stands for the thymus. Thymus is a small gland behind the upper part of the breastbone. So the T cells actually are born in the bone marrow, and then they migrate to the thymus, where they mature. T cells are actually taught by the thymus how to self-tolerate, which means to respect and tolerate self and recognize and kill non-self. Now, this concept of developing self-tolerance in the thymus is called central tolerance. Now, these cells will eventually go to the rest of the body, and some of these T cells are actually raw at the time of leaving the thymus and haven't learned their lesson in self-tolerance, and they will do so with a process called peripheral tolerance. Now, this lesson in self-tolerance in the periphery, that means the rest of the body, is taught to the T cells by the commander of the troops, the T reg, or the regulatory T cell. Now you're equipped to understand how modern transplantation has developed. Now, what happens in transplantation? A person has organ failure. Then surgeons would use half a liver or a kidney from a living person or a complete organ from a dead person and transplant this patient and cure the organ failure. But it doesn't end here. The transplanted organ is a foreign organ. It's non-self. So it will be rejected by the T cells of the person. In order to prevent this immune response, this rejection response, we need to give these patients anti-rejection drugs or immunosuppressive drugs, and we need to give them these drugs for life. Now, these drugs are a little bit like carpet bombing. That means that they get the target, but they also cause a lot of collateral damage, which means that these drugs not only prevent rejection, but also cripple the body's responses to bad intruders like cancer and infections. In addition, they may also damage some healthy tissue. So what we need is drugs that would be able to prevent rejection but not harm the other tissue and not cripple the body's defenses against infection and cancer. Now, a man called Joseph Murray understood this concept of rejection. He was the first surgeon to do a human transplant more than 60 years ago. He had done a lot of experiments in dogs, and he had understood that when he transplanted one dog organ to the other, there was rejection. So he took a clever step. He actually chose a set of identical twins for his first transplant. Richard was suffering from organ failure, kidney failure, and Ronald, his identical twin, agreed to donate a kidney to him. Now, before carrying out this transplant, Joseph Murray 
actually did fingerprinting tests for these two twins at a nearby police station because there weren't any advanced, sophisticated DNA testing available then. Then he transplanted a patch of skin from Ronald to Richard, which, ex which was accepted by Richard and there was no rejection. And then he went ahead and did the kidney transplant. Now the kidney transplant was successful. Richard recovered. In fact, he recovered very well. He married the recovery nurse. They had two children. Now that landmark operation actually paved the way for the five million transplants that have happened to date. In the last 60 years, what has happened to transplantation? Well, there's been progress in basically two directions. One is that we've been trying to make better and better anti-rejection drugs that have less side effects. And secondly, we surgeons are trying to perfect our art of surgery. Now, surgical accuracy and precision have actually increased from 70 to 80 percent back then to about 95 to 99 percent now in different transplants. As for the survival of transplanted organs is concerned, that's usually measured as five and 10 year survival. The five year survival of a liver and a kidney transplant has actually gone up from about 40 percent in the 60s to about 90 percent now. So we surgeons can proclaim that 90% of the transplants are successful. Well, sure, we succeed 95% of the time, we do the transplants, but we still fail the society miserably. I say that because only half the patients who need transplants actually get them in the developed world, and only about a tenth to a fiftieth in the rest of the world. So friends, Clearly, for the next 20 years, we need to make developments in transplantation that would, one, give us unlimited supply of donor organs, and two, it would help us cross the hurdle of rejection in a way that the healthy tissue is not harmed and body's defenses against cancer and infections are not affected. So, in effect, what we need to do is we need to make new immunosuppressive drugs, short courses of which um, will actually lead to durable donor-specific tolerance in the transplanted person. Now, researchers have actually tried to exploit body's own mechanisms of tolerance, the ones I just spelt out a few minutes ago, central and peripheral tolerance, to make these drugs. So the eventual aim of these treatments is to fool the body's immune system, the T cells of the person, into believing that the transplanted organ is actually self rather than non-self. So if you look at the um, approach of central tolerance, then one thing to do is to um, transplant the bone marrow along with, let's say, a kidney transplant from the same donor into the patient. Then what happens is that the T cells that come from this new bone marrow will recognize the kidney as self, and there'll be no rejection. Now, this is a promising approach, and currently we are figuring out safe ways of doing bone marrow transplantation in people who don't actually need them. The other approach would be to transplant the thymus along with the kidney from the same person to achieve the same effect. And again, there is rapid progress being made in trying to work out safe methods of doing this. The other approach to take is that of peripheral tolerance. Now, I already said a few minutes ago that if you want to control what the immune system or what the T cells do in a person, then you have to control their commander, the commander of the troops, the T regs. So the approaches that scientists have been using are that they would put some donor-friendly T regs into the transplanted person or put in substances that would stimulate or give signals to body's own Tregs to become donor friendly. Now, both these approaches are very exciting. In fact, remarkable results have been obtained in humanized mice, in non-human primates, and in limited human trials. In fact, I think that the dream of achieving 
donor specific tolerance with new immunosuppressive drugs which have minimal side effects which don't need to be given lifelong and just need short courses of them is actually in sight 2025 is my prediction now once we have conquered rejection i think it would be possible to use animal organs and tissues for transplantation thus giving us a cheap an easily available source of donor organs the other great source would be lab grown organs especially if they can be made from patients own tissues and cells now let's see what's happening in this direction it is actually possible to grow hollow organs like the blood vessel like the windpipe the trachea or the urinary bladder in the lab what we do is we get cells from the person like from blood or from the inside lining of the cheek called the buccal mucosa and then isolate special cells called stem cells out of those collection of cells now these stem cells actually have the uh, ability to develop into any kind of cell then we would turn them to the desired cell like the liver cell or the heart muscle cell and once the liver cell is made from the stem cells we culture them in the laboratory to enlarge them to a sizable number like to make a liver you would need 100 to 200 billion cells and then these cells along with an appropriate nutrient fluid would be used as ink to actually print out an organ and these bioprinted organs are basically ink dropped on a scaffold that could be synthetic or taken from an animal organ after cleaning the cells the scaffold obviously uh, would eventually get absorbed or get lined by patient's own cells inside and outside and since these cells belong to the patient there is no question of rejection here now bioprinting or growing solid organs in the lab is a little more complex and by solid organs i mean a uh, heart or a liver or kidney now that's because these organs have a very complex structure liver for example has special cells called hepatocytes they are on a supporting matrix and then there are blood vessels which carry the blood and substances to and from the liver and then there is the bile drainage system which enables the bile to drain into the intestine for digestion so if you were to equate making a liver with making a car in a factory it would be like putting hundreds of parts of the car onto a supporting framework the chassis and then have fuel air and electricity circulate through it to make it function now 3d bioprinting of organs is pretty advanced it is possible today to actually make a human liver in the lab but these are only a few millimeters in size compared to the actual human liver which is 15 into 20 into 12 cm and approximately 1300 grams in weight so the age of lab grown liver and other organs is not far i think this will be happening routinely by 2040 so if we look at the next 20 odd years and try to solve the transplant puzzle and recreate some of the magic that was created by our deities a very long time ago one wonders if we are moving forward to the past or back to the future i will leave you to decide that thank you very much for listening